Hello, hello everyone. Um, being that it is 3 p.m. in the afternoon, can I get a hello back just to make sure everybody? Yes. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today and welcome everyone. So my name is Valerie Delva and I lead data AI ML strategy and solutions for AWS. I'm excited for the discussion that we're about to have today. So we're gonna cover how do you build an integrated data strategy and why is that fundamental requirement for unlocking ML and generative AI use cases and a lot of the disruptive work that a lot of you are hearing across healthcare and life sciences. Um, so to start, what are we gonna cover today? Uh, a key theme you're gonna notice throughout this discussion is the importance of data as a critical differentiator to accelerate insights and scale innovation. But more specifically, uh, what are the practical steps you need to take to do that? I'd like to first start with, what are we seeing across the industry? Challenges, opportunities, opportunities as challenges, challenges as opportunities. Um, and then what are the key components that go into building an integrated but yet differentiated data strategy? We'll also discuss how the AWS Health uh, data portfolio of fit for purpose services and solutions and some of our partner offerings can bring this data strategy to life while reducing the time and resources needed to build it at an enterprise level. Um, what I will say is I won't be the only one on stage uh, as well. Um, I will be joined by my colleague Darmesh Takar and Patrick Cody from Johnson & Johnson who have been building out their own integrated data strategy to drive faster innovation and really think about AI and ML use cases within the organization. So you'll get to see real life impact and change that they're driving as well. So to get started, I often like to take a step back before we dive into the contents of a session to really think about who are we doing this work for? Um, what are we connecting it to? So a question that I'd like each of you to think about as you listen to this presentation and this discussion is, how can we together scale and accelerate the future of health? And I mean the future of health where genomics, machine learning, artificial intelligence can drive more predictive, preventative, personalized, and participatory care and medicine for all. Uh, something I often say to my colleagues and I very much believe is that some of the things that you see on the slide and that we'll talk about today are not things that we're looking to achieve 20 years from now or even a decade from today, but things that we can put in place right now, that we have a very real opportunity to meaningfully change how we define what health is, what wellness is, um, by leveraging the power of data, AI, and ML. So, with that, let's dive in. Um, over the past several years, I would say there are four or so trends and opportunities that we kind of bucket that you'll see on the slide of uh, how healthcare and life science organizations are facing either new risks, new challenges, uh, new opportunities in how you create, store, and use data. Um, but until quite recently, the reality has been you could not easily address the four buckets that you see here with the technologies available. I'd like to walk through each of these a little bit, and then I'll also go through some of the options and services we have in how to address that. So the first, which many of you uh, may be familiar with, if you work in life sciences, a lot of you have been asked to greatly speed up um, and just change how you discover and develop new therapies. It now takes just under a decade, so about nine years and $3 billion to develop a therapy. Um, in addition to the fact that that has tremendous impact on the patient um, and caregivers, it's also economically unsustainable, if, if you think about it end to end. All of this means that you need to make better use of the data to speed up early research, clinical development, and clinical trials, but also prove efficacy to payers, including through the use of real world data. So challenge number one that you see here is, how do you find and use data faster while at the same time delivering on the outcomes that are needed to accelerate change for patients and reducing costs? The second challenge, the volume and complexity of data are both exploding. So for example, you can, any lab that you're in now can generate multiple terabytes, terabytes a day from newer assays like cell painting, RNA sequencing, and cryo-EM. Yet, and this is not a new stat, 97% of data generated today goes unused because it's not stored in a manner that makes it easy to find, 
or to use. And I'll come back to that a little later in the presentation. Plus, scaling up the storage for these data types would be hard enough if there were all the same types of data. But as you can see on the right side of the screen, they're not. They're often different data modalities. Now let's continue on these observations. We've talked about the need to speed up and make medicines faster at lower costs and ensure they're targeted. Um, we've talked about the volume of data that you have to deal with. The other trend that we're seeing is that more and more, um, and every year there's a growing percentage of the new therapies that actually reach the market that originated from some form of collaboration between a biopharma company and a third party. So that third party could be a startup, an academic medical center, a population research partner like the UK Biobank, for example. So today, more than 50% of drugs launches now originate from such partnerships. So challenge number three, um, how do you more efficiently discover what data your collaborators have and what you're allowed to access and then make appropriate use of that data? Um, the fourth one, which is not a surprise, so I'm not even gonna ask do you remember it, it's generative AI. And uh, to make sure we're all on the same page, generative AI, I'm defining as a type of artificial intelligence that can create new content and ideas, uh, including conversations, uh, stories, images, videos, and music. The promise of generative AI, as we know in healthcare and life sciences, is vast. There is hype, there's hope, there's reality in between that. Um, but with the potential to accelerate innovation and increase efficiencies across the value chain, um, it requires you to efficiently manage the large volumes of data needed to train these models. Um, there are also important considerations that all organizations who deal in the spaces uh, that we're in, especially if you're in healthcare and life sciences and you're dealing with patient data, proprietary data that you must address, such as keeping your data private, secure, and ensuring that only the people who should have access to this information have the right level of access. So generative AI only intensifies the needs that I've talked about, so I want to spend maybe another minute or two to connect that dot between the challenges that we're seeing in generative AI, but also the opportunities that you have today when it comes to data and that. So the first thing I'll say, and which uh, probably repeat a couple of times, data is the difference between generic generative AI applications and those applications that know your business, understand your patient needs and the outcomes you need to deliver and your workforce very deeply. So every company, at some point, could have access to the same foundation models, but companies that will be successful in building a generative AI application with real business value are those that are willing to do so using their own valuable data. And the companies that have not yet found ways to efficiently harmonize and provide ready access to their data in a privacy-preserving and secure way will be unable to fine-tune generative AI to unlock its transformative potential. So, as we think about the areas that we're all in, um, this is so true for healthcare and life sciences where data and the use cases are so specialized. The amount and types of data are growing exponentially. So for example, if you just think about genome data alone, it's expected to reach 40 exabytes, not terra, 40 exabytes um, in the next decade alone. Now another important point. Um, because often we talk about the way data makes impact is not just having information and having the data, it's getting to insights and evidence generation. Generative AI does not promise instant insights. The key to delivering healthcare and life sciences use cases with impact is quality data. Um, and in fact, this is the number one challenge for many of the organizations we work with in realizing the potential of generative AI. Data systems are often sprawling, siloed, and complex with diverse data sets and spread across different data lakes and data warehouses and uh, cloud databases, SaaS applications, devices, and on-prem solutions. To get meaningful insights, you need a clear data and infrastructure strategy um, and really uh, embedding data as a differentiator um, as the core of any of these innovative use cases that you may be thinking through. So how can we help? Talk through opportunities, I've talked through challenges and key things that you need to think about. Uh, to be honest, we realized a few years ago that continuing to use general purpose cloud services alone would not get the job done. Um, and storing, analyzing, and cataloging, and sharing multimodal health data 
in healthcare and life sciences required purpose-built services and solutions, not just from AWS, but also our partners. So I'm gonna cover a few of these services. There are many other sessions we have during uh, reInvent that I'll dive deeper into them. Um, but I wanna highlight uh, some of the core ones and some of the new additions as well that we have. So I'd like to start with analyzing and storing multimodal data. So here on the left on the slide, um, we've developed a range of offerings, but to start with HealthLake, it enables you to store and analyze text-based clinical data, uh, such as electronic medical records and claims data. And as a key feature, it automatically converts unstructured clinical data, like physician notes, for example, into structured data and provides a chronological view of individual or patient population health data. Additionally, our HealthLake imaging service can reduce medical imaging storage costs by up to 40%, while also allowing multiple users to access that same, um, a copy of that same image at the same time with sub-second image retrieval. So now, this third pillar that I'll put up, health omics. You can transform genomic, transcriptomic, and other omics data at scale to generate insights, improve health, and advance scientific discoveries. Uh, I would say perhaps the most important thing before I get to the last service I wanna call out on the slide is all of these services can make their data available for analytics and machine learning in a matter of minutes, um, but not just as separate data types, but in a multimodal manner as well. And finally, the last one that I wanna call out on here on the right side is HealthScribe. Uh, for those unfamiliar, we actually just announced that it's HIPAA eligible uh, about a week and a half ago. Um, HealthScribe empowers health, healthcare software vendors to automatically generate transcripts, summarize notes, and clinical insights by analyzing patient-clinician conversations in their clinical applications. Now, let's talk about data collaborations and cataloging, linking, and accessing data. Across all teams in research or clinical development, for example, users often start with three questions, and I get these questions a lot. Um, who has the data that I need? Am I allowed to even access this data? And then the third question is, if all those two things are true, is it even in a format or stored in a manner that makes it useful? So keep that in mind. So to start on the left, I'm excited to announce that just last week uh, we introduced uh, AWS NTC Resolution as a HIPAA eligible service. And as you think about what it allows you to do, you can easily match, link, and enhance related records across uh, multiple applications, multiple systems, and data stores using flexible and configurable workflows that only take minutes to, to set up. Um, another thing we often hear from teams across research, development, and clinical organizations is the need to access real world data. Whether it's to study biomarkers or disease pathways or design a clinical trial. Um, but many of our customers we've learned and realized spend hundreds of millions of dollars per year licensing real world data. Um, and I'd say let that, um, let that fact sink in. In addition to that, um, to build a single cohort of data, they've told us often can take many weeks from the time someone decides what cohort they need, then to find, sample, and license the data, and then once they have it in their own environment and it's in-house, to convert the data to a format or a model that their team uses. So we're at a mission to change that. We don't think that should be the process. <laughs> um, we wanna go from weeks to days to even um, hours. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we created AWS Data Exchange or what we fondly and internally refer to as ADX that you'll see here on the right. Now, we also realized that while ADX is helping more and more customers uh, every day, researchers and healthcare organizations sometimes do not want to or cannot um, or are not able to put their data into an exchange. We announced clean rooms to exactly address that issue and these needs. So with clean rooms, you can securely analyze and collaborate without sharing or having to reveal your underlying data sets. Besides clean rooms, uh, I would say Another aspect of the conversations that I often have are, well, it's really great that you're telling me about third-party collaborations, but in building an end-to-end -end data strategy, um, you're talking about accessing data in other organizations. How do I even unlock the data that's within my own organization? And how can you help there? Um, 
as most of you know, uh, finding out what data the organization already has and only allowing appropriate users to access that data can be incredibly hard. Um, and then on top of that, the reality is that there are several great catalog services out there and offerings, including some on AWS. But something that we realized is that uh, healthcare and life sciences uh, use cases are not sufficiently addressed with general purpose catalog services. So that's why we created DataZone that you see here. Customers are leveraging DataZone to build an enterprise data ecosystem like a data mesh platform with federated governance where multiple personas across domains like R&D and commercial can collaborate at the project level. Now, I've highlighted many services in our portfolio and uh, the key thing you may be thinking next is, well, how does that help inform an integrated data strategy and what are the components of it, as I promised that we would cover? So to start, an integrated data strategy is not just about breaking down internal data silos. It is a key place to start. But once you break down those silos, it's very important to think about doing so in a manner that uh, places secure, govern access, so only those who need access have access at the right time. And then also identifying which use cases are critical to driving your business outcomes and the types of data that are needed to execute on those use cases because all data types are not created equally and to be able to have successful use cases, you really have to think about the data quality and the data that's being put in. Now, perhaps you're a biopharma collaborating with a clinical research, uh, collaborating in clinical research with an academic medical center or a hospital network, and you need to augment your own data with insights hidden in patient medical records or research data sets. Your data strategy, for example, would need to include seamless in integration of real world data sets in a secure, privacy preserving environment, purpose built for third party collaborations of this kind. In addition, you would need to have a comprehensive range of analytics, ML, and generative AI capabilities uh, to go from data to insights. Um, with that, I'd like to pause there and say, I've laid out, here are the challenges, here are the opportunities, uh, here are the things to think about in the services and solutions we may offer and the building blocks for an integrated data strategy. I'd like to introduce my colleague, Darmesh, to talk about how they're pulling this together and bringing it to life with some real world, uh, with real world use cases and the impact that they're making. Thank you, Valerie, uh, for that setup and the healthcare context. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dharmesh Tucker. I am a senior director and a product group leader for commercial operations data insights at. Uh, Johnson & Johnson Innovative Medicine. Some of you are wondering, formerly known as Janssen. Uh, you know, we went through and you'll kind of see some of our new, um, you know, positioning and how we like to uh, sort of position the new J&J. So let me start with our purpose. Um, our purpose is we blend hard science ingenuity to profoundly impact health for humanity. And our unique focus, if you see, uh, is to tackle the world's toughest challenges and we genuinely have the tools, you know, and you'll see in future slides around the modalities and including surgical interventional tools to sort of make that happen. Our aspiration, we believe health is everything. I think anybody who has gone through any health situation, you know, for personally or friends, families, you definitely recognize that. Uh, you know, and we are, we are building a world where complex diseases are prevented, treated, and even cured, and you'll see examples of that coming as well. And where treatment are smarter, less invasive. You know, our approach, like I said, is solving the toughest health challenges, accelerating innovation through science and technology. Uh, we clearly believe that technology will play a tremendous role, uh, and especially the power of data and insights in this. And then also transforming the overall patient experience um, through this process as well. So Johnson & Johnson, two main areas what we call Johnson & Johnson Innovative Medicine, formerly Janssen, I said, and j, &J MedTech. If you look at the Innovative Medicine, uh, really we have some amazing strengths, uh, whether it is in disease area stronghold or what we call the pathway area strongholds. Uh, you know, how do we treat disease to a certain pathway? Certain disease can, more than one disease could be treat for, uh, treated, for example, with a uh, pathway, for example. 
Uh, and in the medtech side, clearly, uh, you know, solving some of the toughest uh, healthcare challenges at the intersection of biology and technology. Zooming in on what is innovative medicine, these are the five sort of uh, therapeutic area or focus areas uh, that we are really, and how we are managing our portfolio for today, but also evolving for the future. So five areas, oncology, immunology, cardiovascular metabolics, neuroscience, and retina and pulmonary heart failure, hypertension. If you look at, for example, oncology, you know, we have a slew of products, for example, in multiple myeloma, including, uh, first for us, a personalized medicine in CAR-T, in cell therapy, uh, that is in market uh, car -Victi. And that has, you know, an extremely high, uh, you know, remission rate, uh, you know, in high 90%, for example. Uh, in immunology, we, you know, work across the spectrum of room, derm, uh, and, um, uh, you know, and, um, uh, you know, rheumatoid arthritis as well. So, and uh, in cardiovascular, for example, therapies like uh, Zoralto, which is a, you know, blood thinner. In neuroscience, we have a therapy which is uh, for treatment-resistant depression, for example, you know, so very unique uh, sort of area. And pulmonary arterial hypertension and retina. So retina is going to be a first gene therapy, for example, for us. So as you see, a lot of the next generation products are getting into personalized medicine and cell and gene therapy uh, market as well. I mean, this, you know, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with life science industry, clearly a value chain of life science industry from research, you know, to development, to manufacturing, to commercial. What I'll talk about today is the commercial data and insights sort of strategy. And we really like to think of commercial as that bridge, right? I mean, there is so much investment uh, and this is a, you know, a very purpose-driven organization around solving the health, health challenges of the world. And commercial is really becoming more and more critical bridge to getting to that therapies to the patient, as we, especially as we get into more personalized uh, medicines uh, space as well. So before I go into what does our commercial machine, what does our data insights sort of lenses look like, Let's talk a little bit about what is happening in US healthcare market. I'm sure some of you are familiar with uh, most of this, if not all. So these are what are I call the five Ps of healthcare industry, right? Payer, provider, patient, physician, and policy. But I also like to talk about the sixth P, which is the product. And if you've been in this industry long enough, you know, 20 years ago, it was all about uh, small molecule market, you know. And now if you talk about, you know, it went to large molecule biologics to now into cell and gene therapy, right? So there is a, there is a clear evolution, for example, happening in the world of product. Let's look at, for example, some key facets in these areas. Spare. I mean, we are all familiar with the gross to net pressure, for example. And this is data that is public for Janssen. Uh, in our transparency report, you can search it up. Uh, and if you look at, for example, last year's transparency report, we paid $39 billion in rebates. This money is more than the revenue we recognized, net revenue we recognize. So we are actually paying more than 50% of our list price in, as rebates. Uh, if you actually look over this period, our net price is actually down by 20%. Uh, you know, so if you look at the news headline, you probably don't see a lot of that, uh, but these are facts, you know, and you can certainly look it up. We are all familiar with the consolidation happening at the provider level, uh, you know, for any large biofarm today. Top 100 customers cover for 80% of their business. Uh, and physicians are becoming more and more employees of these organizations. So it's really, uh, you know, driving that formulary control, things like that, sort of, you know, from that level perspective. Policy, I think IRA is on, you know, is a big topic on all of our radars uh, right now. And how do you deal with that? Uh, and then, of course, patient. Uh, you know, where some statistics like on an average, a third of the scripts are never filled. Why are they not filled, you know, for example? Uh, complexity of patient journey, you know, in some of the therapies, you know, step therapies, things like that, to get through, for example, right? An increasing cost burden, you know, patients are sharing, for example. I talked about the product mix being uh, changing as well, but at the bottom, the, you know, the blue, pink box, if you will, are some macro trends. So if you look at, you know, and Valerie touched on it, uh, the explosion of data with digitization of healthcare, which is a great thing, uh, but how do we harness that well? You know, industry disruptors, you know, from startup to tech giants who are playing in healthcare industry, for example. 
verticalization of industry. This is interesting. It's called pay wider these days. I don't know if you've heard that term, but literally payer and providers uh, combining uh, and sort of operating that uh, uh, as an integrated uh, service, if you will. Uh, and then COVID-19, you know, if you all lived through it, uh, suddenly reps lost access for a full year. And that changed certain behaviors, you know, in terms of HCP, you lost access, for example. We were losing access, but we lost a significant step change sort of in access, if you will. Um, and so it is kind of driving some step change around non-personal. You know, this is as a, as a business traditionally has been a very personal uh, selling business, but it's becoming more and more uh, non-personal channels are becoming more and more important, if you will. If you look at all these challenges, you know, and I, I, don't, I don't want to be sounding very obvious, but really data and insights. And when I say insights as traditional and machine learning and generative is really the answer to, uh, you know, practically all these uh, challenges, if you will, in the industry. So what are we doing uh, about this thing? So this is sort of a macro view of what I call a commercial machine. Um, you know, and uh, you can even call it a data flywheel, right? Uh, you know, if you look at it, it starts really, most of us source uh, a lot of syndicated data, what we call in the industry, be it scripts, claims, uh, you know, APLD type data, for example, things like that, our own media, paid media services data. We sort of, you know, organize it, integrate it, and today, uh, we are actually using, uh, at least as as uh, JNJ Innovative Medicine, a lot of machine learning model, and we have really moved away from this static region frequency type model to really organize this data, make sense out of it through traditional or machine learning insights, combine that with the right content that is relevant to the customer, whatever the persona may be. You know, if it's going to be through a promotional content or it's going to be through a medical conversation, obviously retaining those compliance firewalls or it will be for patient communication where that opportunity exists, where they've signed up for our patient support services, things like that. Or you could be integrating in a healthcare ecosystem as well. So it's really this machine, and then you kind of you know, learn and repeat, if you will, through this process. Um, if you now, if I switch gears a little bit, and take a little bit of, you know, depending on uh, like the point I made around personalized medicine, things like that, where the patient data, you know, and Valerie again touched on it today as well, is becoming super important. If you look at where the therapy uh, mix is moving uh, between, you know, hyper-personalized, you know, rare, ultra-rare disease, having access to world-class integrated patient data is super important to understand everything from customer experience, patient journey, you know, standards of care, how people are moving from therapy to therapy, for example, when they are primed for a therapy that you may have, uh, you know, which could be line three, line four sometimes uh, in these cases as well, especially in personalized work. So it's really aggregating that data, and then you have two tracks. You will have a de-identified track, which to some degree exists today, but this is an even more integrated lens into that, that you can use to drive, for example, HCP promotional, uh, engagement, knowing patient level opportunities, which doctors, for example, have the right patient. So this is, you know, we are all in the industry, we've been talking for the last few years about next best action, next best customer. This is really now becoming a next best patient, uh, you know, play, if you will, right? And, you know, how do you reach to that patient, if you will? So that's the sort of the de-identified track. Where it's consented preference, for example, you could be working with identified track, but if you don't want to, you know, we talked, I think today Swami touched upon it a little bit, where they have an evolution. At least the current standard is you kind of have a synthetic copy of that data, if you will, or a synthetic version of that data, uh, rather than the real data. Build your models and deploy that model back into that, uh, you know, sort of third party or a data aggregator. From there, you can drive customer engagement, if you will, uh, as well. So that's sort of the uh, evolution. Uh, what has also come into play now is generative AI. Uh, you know, and Patrick will come and talk about one of the use cases around unstructured data after me. Uh, but it's also really about structured data. So, you know, for example, we have deployed uh, already in field at a pilot level, a Repco pilot. Uh, you know, wherein uh, a rep can now have a conversation uh, around insights. So we are already today at a point, like I talked about the dynamic engagement plan, where we are telling the rep which doctor to go see, which message to deliver and why. 
the, now we are giving reps opportunity to further ask those questions through Copilot, for example. Um, so that's sort of the model evolution. Um, if I zoom in a little bit on the current state of data um, and data science ecosystem, this is a product of market evolution. So if you think about it over the last decade or so, as you know, a pair, uh, you, we talked about the you know, rebates, for example. So pair, for example, data start to become important. We layered that in you know, with the traditional Rx and syndicated data. Patient and personalized therapies made patient level data more important. Real world data with EMR, EHR, you know, started to become more important. What ended up happening to some degree is we have the lake, but to some degree there are these domains of data. Uh, and again, Stephanie touched on the real world data, for example, you know, where every team that is building a customer capability, you know, be it for a commercial, medical, patient, uh, roles or even for strategic customer groups is sort of starting from this. It's kind of process harmonized, but it's still relatively raw data and sort of doing this whole thing all over again, right? Applying business rules, for example, you know. Um, so those kind of things uh, are sort of today slowing us down and sort of reducing our agility, especially both in the in-person market, but also in the non-personal channel, you know, where the decisions have to be very dynamic. I want to serve an ad, for example, uh, in, a, in at a third party, it better be a far more dynamic situation than what it is today. Um, so if you look at the evolution of this model today, where we are going now is really building data products, be it patient 360s of the world, you know, be it, um, you know, HCP 360, payer 360s, for example, and really laying a fabric layer on top of that. You know, and today, if you attended Swami's keynote, I think he said it the best, you know, because this, this, this maturity now is about comprehensive data, you know, that is integrated, made available, and then governed. You know, and talking about some of the products and capabilities, uh, for example, you know, uh, from an Amazon perspective, be it data zone, you know, be it data exchanges, if it's with third party, uh, you know, be it... Um, uh, you know, clean rooms, for example, you know, where you don't want to bring the patient level data, but yet you want to run models, for example. So those things are becoming more and more important uh, here as well. So before I turn over to uh, Patrick, I will close with, uh, you know, a quote from Dr. Paul Janssen, you know, and he's been the inspiration, if you will, for our innovative medicine business. And his relent relentless focus on patient at the center of healthcare was best captured in this quote. And you would say that there is so much more to be done and the patients are waiting. In fact, in his meetings, he would have an empty chair in the conference room. And he called on that as the patient, as representing patient in that room to ensure that every decision we made, that patient is thought about and is a stakeholder in that conversation. I personally have really drawn inspiration through this, uh, you know, in, in the work that I do. And I believe that really this serving the patient will be at the intersection of data and insights. So with that, I'm going to invite Patrick uh, and he's going to walk us through a use case, for example, in, in the generative AI, especially in unstructured market. Thank you. Thank you, Darmesh. <clears throat> uh, Patrick here, data scientist with j and &J. So unstructured data is continually sprouting up with new business questions. And a key industry challenge that Valerie mentioned earlier is harnessing this data from end to end to make it more actionable. So how do we bring siloed and unstructured data into our core data strategy that Darmesh mentioned so that we could drive value to reach more patients. Well, generative AI, naturally, uh, thanks to its versatility to a variety of use cases. Consider, for example, uh, efficiently streamlining onboarding documentation to specific teams or <clears throat> efficiently integrating past engagement documentation of vendor partners to evaluate you know, which vendor partner to choose. The challenge is balancing flexibility with use case specificity. 
So how do we flexibly match the right tools for the job? And we want a reusable solution to avoid a myriad of unique approaches. So I'll start with a hypothetical use case to show how we can easily adapt a familiar uh, reusable solution to one that is task optimized. And so consider this scenario. We've paid a vendor to conduct market research about medication trackers. However, with a recent change in the market landscape, uh, the business took a different direction. And so how do we best leverage these readouts uh, and you know, get the most out of what we've already paid for? In the next slides, I'll cover what's now become an industry standard Gen AI solution framework and highlight <clears throat> the steps we can take to tailor this uh, general solution to a specific use case. So uh, to do this, we have three main considerations that uh, we need to address. The solution to this scenario uh, needs to bring together otherwise siloed research, but it needs to do so in a way to avoid diluting that research with uh, extraneous information. And we also want to avoid reinventing the wheel, so we want to minimize build overhead. And finally, we wanna ensure that we can leverage any kind of document that we might have. And so, for an easily configurable solution, we'll apply the now standard retrieval augmented generation design that I'm sure you've probably heard if you've gone to a few talks uh, this week, uh, otherwise known as RAG. And <clears throat> we're gonna use uh, data already in our environment on S3. And so when a new business question comes in, the relevant research readouts are retrieved, and then those are passed through one or more prompts to large language models <coughs> to address this updated business question. So this RAG solution design is comprised of storage, retrieval, LLM orchestration, and a UI layer. So the benefit of this design is that we could limit the context of our inquiries to a specific set of research uh, to minimize hallucinations. So this solution framework empowers our business stakeholders to make the most of their ability of making complex associations between pools of research uh, and efficiently enables them to match, quickly match insights to specific sources. And in this way, we could feed this otherwise siloed unstructured data into our data flywheel and make it more impactful. The challenge I'll focus on is tailoring this general solution uh, to best suit our hypothetical market research use case. So we need to select the right design components to match the business value to the solution cost. We have to have control over uh, components and UI. Uh, we need to manage user access, address compliance, and we also wanna be able to scale appropriately. So our process to address this challenge involves systematically evaluating components on a use case by use case need. And starting with the retrieval component, we compare manual retrieval methods such as using open source models from Hugging Face to vendor solutions such as AWS Kendra, among others. We evaluate this set of retrieval components uh, with a combination of inference endpoints, both uh, open source, again, uh, as well as models available via AWS Bedrock and from other uh, partners. So with tools like Bedrock, we could quickly evaluate a variety of models through a single API endpoint, enabling us to quickly optimize this particular framework for the task at hand. And recently, this RAG framework has been in already incorporated into all-in-one tools, such as Amazon Q, announced recently, uh, among others. And these tools handle the infrastructure and models under the hood for a quick uh, chat solution. We can also use these all-in-one tools as a sort of benchmark for our custom uh, solution design. 
And so a prevailing challenge is, of course, model selection. This decision is important not only for performance and cost demands, but also in adhering to safety guardrails. And so having a reference framework uh, to meet all of these considerations is critical. We compare our customized designs to those all-in-one benchmarks using an in-house process that provides us with a quantitative readout of performance of a certain solution design. And this process we have is agnostic to use case, so it enables us to weigh performance with cost uh, with, for you know, an, any use case we might have. <clears throat> so we, what, what we end up with is a ranking of solution designs by quantitative performance. And so once we have this accuracy ranking, we can finally take cost into account. And of course, the most powerful solution uh, may not be the most practical. So what we do is we plot uh, the design performance against cost. In this hypothetical market research use case, the best model for this task happened to be Claude Instant. Uh, and for this particular solution, the speed to the solution was critical. So we employed uh, AWS Bedrock to quickly evaluate a variety of models, and we leveraged uh, AWS Kendra for uh, a fast retrieval uh, implementation. So this part of the framework we use, this is only part of the framework we use to evaluate uh, the best model for a particular use case. Uh, there are other considerations that need to be addressed, including you know, safety uh, and security, of course. So, so far, we've shown a, an established RAG design framework. We can use this existing infrastructure as groundwork to incorporate more current capabilities that are evolving with Gen AI, both at the retrieval component and at the generative inference endpoint. And so to name a few of these capabilities, uh, you know, aggregate operations on unstructured data for measuring consensus, metadata filtering with natural language, incorporating current information, and multi-hop inference back and forth between the retrieval and generative inference endpoints. And many of these capabilities are already possible uh, and can be achieved with LLM agents. So eventually, as the Gen AI landscape evolves, low-code and no-code solutions <clears throat> like AWS Canvas and AI Studio will reduce the need for custom code-level infrastructure. And with this, Data will become, of course, more accessible, bringing more human minds into uh, the field with more diverse uh, and actionable insights. This will, of course, accelerate our solutions to business challenges with the end goal of reaching more patients. And with that, I'd like to pass it back to Valerie to wrap us up. Thank you, Patrick. Um, what I will say is I, I just want to share a few closing thoughts on what we've heard today. And I did promise that I'd put this slide back up. Um, as we think of what Darmesh spoke to, some of the challenges that I set up, and then also the use cases that Patrick walked through, I hope that the key takeaway here is data is your differentiator, full stop. But also data is your differentiator for generative AI for ML use cases or to scale innovation across the board. Um, and as we think about how does this all come together and in, into an integrated data strategy, we've heard quite a few of this, uh, these details, but what I'd like to call out what you see on the slide here is having an integrated data strategy means your data is actionable. It's purposeful, it's leading to insights. It's making it easier to find, access, collaborate, and perform multimodal analyses across 
different data assets and different data types. And at the end of the day, it's not just around predicting and analyzing the different information that you have, but if you look at the far right, it's really aligning it to the business use cases um, and the patient outcomes. So whether that's to detect diseases earlier, design better clinical trials, or even speed up the development of medicines faster. So I wanna make sure that we're keeping that top of mind. Um, and a couple of closing thoughts. Um, I go back to how we started this conversation and some of the things that Dharmesh called out as well. Um, we can turn the challenges and opportunities that we've been talking about today into impactful outcomes, um, into em impactful solutions to drive better outcomes for patients. So think about all the work that you are each leading in your organization um, to drive precision diagnostics, precision medicine, targeted drug design, and uh, how do we go from world data to world evidence generation. We're making real progress towards precision health. Um, but I think we're just at the cusp, given what data and AI can do. Um, I call this out. Uh, this is one initiative that you probably have seen some folks with pins or you've seen a similar slide. In other pre uh, presentations this year, we've partnered with uh, one of our customers, the Children's Brain Tumor Network, to showcase artwork by uh, patient Cameron, who's age five. Um, Cameron chose to draw us all a picture of her swimming to showcase her superpower. Um, so I'd say if you want to learn more about this particular use case, the pin and Cameron's story, um, in how we can advance pediatric cancer research, uh, but also get your own pin, visit, visit us at the Healthcare and Life Sciences Lounge. This is more information about it. There at the expo area, it's located within the AWS Industry Pavilion in the main Venetian Expo Hall. Uh, in addition to collecting your pin, uh, there's features, demos um, for some of the latest services that I was talking about earlier today, including our generative AI use cases for healthcare and life sciences. Um, and there are also some upcoming sessions that you'll see here, and also if you scan the code um, for a full view of our life sciences track. With that, I'd like to say thank you. My contact information is there in case anybody has any questions. Um, we've enjoyed the discussion, so thank you. <laughs>